Okay, good morning. As people are logging on, let's go ahead and get started. Welcome to the Illinois Soybean Association's IL Soy Advisor webinar. I am Deanna Burkhart, Agronomic Programs Coordinator at the Illinois Soybean Association. Today, Dr. Andrew Marganat will be presenting the four R's of phosphorus management for Illinois soybean production. Andrew Marganat is a soil scientist and faculty member at the University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign. And after his PhD research on soil fertility in East Africa, he joined the Illinois agricultural scene in 2017, where he leads a research team that evaluates nutrient biogeochemistry in our state and the greater North Central US region. Dr. Marganot's research focuses on phosphorus management, soil health, and carbon crediting, with the goal of supporting efficient use of nutrients for crop productivity that support environmental quality. I'm gonna go on to the next slide. And to support growers' profitability while contributing to nutrient loss reduction goals, trade-offs among yield and environmental outcomes specific to soybean production and sensitive to cropping system context must be quantified. In Illinois and the greater North Central region, soybean is uniquely situated to contribute to nutrient loss reduction and capitalizing on proposed carbon crediting programs. To this end, ISA-funded research results will be reviewed on the four hours of phosphorus management, which stands to deliver nitrogen loss reduction benefits, as well as a newly initiated project to provide benchmarks on interrelated soil, water, and climate quality outcomes of soybean production. This webinar is being recorded, and the recording, as well as more information on ISA-funded research projects can be found at ilsoyadvisor.com. Questions can be submitted through the webinar Q&A at any time during the presentation. Stephanie Porter, ISA's Outreach Agronomist, is here to help facilitate. Also, one CEU in nutrient management is available for certified crop advisors. A QR code will be provided at the end of the presentation. If you prefer to email your name and CCA number, that is also an option. And you can send that to Connie Copley, C-O-N-N-I-E dot C-O-P-L-E-Y at ilsoy.org. Okay, with that, I'll hand that over to you. Thanks, Dana. Mm -hmm. All right, so uh, today, along with the cat here that won't leave me alone, I'm gonna talk about some of the results from a two-year ISA-funded project, looking at the four R's of phosphorus, specifically for soybean across uh, two major regions of the state. So the glaciated North Central region and the less recently glaciated Southern third of Illinois. So this work that you're about to hear was uh, done uh, largely by PhD students Yuhei Nakayama, shown here, um, and I'll be speaking on his behalf. He is currently in Japan doing some carbon analyses. All right. So uh, this work was, as I mentioned to your project, the full product name that was ISA Checkoff funded is shown here. Um, and we've got a few members to acknowledge uh, our head field technician, Michael Douglas, a few other PhD students like uh, Patricia Leon, uh, Talon Becker from U of I Extension and Andy Fisher at the Ewing Center, one of our two sites that you'll hear about today. I want to begin by providing some context of what motivated this work. Uh, this proposal was being written uh, for the research, at least at the beginning of the spike in P input costs. And as we've seen, uh, inputs of phosphorus, as well as K, as well as N, they all spiked uh, pretty high uh, post-COVID by 2022, this last year. Um, and so they hit an all-time high for DAP of uh, 983. This is an average value high. I know it was lower or higher in some parts of the state. And that's compared to um, around 480 per ton of DAP um, pre-COVID, even into COVID with January 2021 prices. So we saw uh, basically a doubling of input prices for phosphorus, leading, I think, a lot of producers and researchers to think about what are ways that we might be a little bit more efficient with our inputs of phosphorus. At the same time, we also are facing the EPA milestone check-in on reductions of phosphorus losses in the year 2025. That's a, that is 1.5 years away. Um, and as you can see, our state is in one of the hot spots of P losses. Now, not all of this is from fertilizer. A lot is, uh, mostly all of it actually, is coming from erosion of soil. That's a soil conservation challenge. But the idea is that when we do lose phosphorus from fertilizers, 
Uh, that's an economic loss first and foremost for the producer. Those are fertilizer dollars being washed away. And then there are some impacts that are negative on water quality. So the project that we had in mind was to evaluate as a first step, the four R's of phosphorus and specifically for soybean. So why is this? Well, we tend to think of the four R's for nitrogen and largely for corn that gets a lot of attention and rightly so, it's important. We wanted to focus on, I think the, the overlooked questions of how much room is there to finesse the four R's for phosphorus and explicitly for soybean. Typically, we've treated soybean in this state, this is going back to the 1950s, as a residual feeder. We apply P and K in front of corn and a two-year corn soybean crop rotation. So the soybean is able to uh, feed off of the residual P and K a year later. And this approach works more or less, but there is a lot of evidence that we can increase soybean yields and increase use efficiency of P and K. And increased use efficiency is a good thing because it means that you can, um, well, cut back on the input and get the same yield or even have the same inputs and increase yield in some cases. Now, when we think about uh, the four R's for phosphorus, uh, the first, things, first thing that comes to mind for the rate would be the removal rates. So for every bushel of soybean, as well as for corn that comes off the field, we have to put back the P as well as the K that was in that grain. This is basic mass balance thermodynamics. Now, uh, what you use as a maintenance rate, though, might have some wiggle room year to year. So in a high input price year, like the last two years, uh, there might be a, a chance to coast or to draw down a little bit on built up P levels. So might you mine your soil just for a couple of years, it's mining technically, as a way to avoid very high input prices. And that would mean cutting back on the maintenance rate a little bit. Second is um, the right time. So this is a key of the four R's. And for, again, P and K, we traditionally put it in front of corn and in the fall. What if we played around with in front of soybean, but also uh, in the fall or in the spring? There's reason to think that spring applied nutrients uh, have greater use efficiency. Again, more profitability potentially. The right place tends to go hand in hand. We, we uh, typically do a fall broadcast. Uh, sometimes a banding with strip systems, with a strip till, excuse me, in the fall. Uh, but in the spring, we can broadcast or band right before we plant. And there's evidence that banding can also increase, you guessed it, PU sufficiency, meaning we can cut back on rates uh, down to maintenance for sub maintenance and temporarily maintain yield. Then the right source, and this one is my favorite one, and I'm going to spend some time talking about this because it offers a lot of benefits, I think, for water quality, as well as what we consider to be a free nutrient. In case you're wondering what I'm talking about, free nutrients, well, we typically, in fact, we dominantly use ammonium phosphates, MAP and DAP, in the Midwest and most of the US, for that matter, as our P source. And you might be wondering, well, what's the other option if not MAP and DAP? Well, um, there's also things like triple superphosphorus, uh, even rock phosphorus, but TSP, I think of as the analog of MAP and DAP, it's 46% P2O5, um, and it's highly water soluble. It doesn't have the, quote, free nitrogen that you're getting along with the P, though it does have appreciable sulfur, which might matter for soybeans more and more, especially down south of Illinois. There's also novel, for, well, novel inputs of P, including fertilizers like struvite, which is a magnesium ammonium phosphorus. So we've typically been confined to two options, at least uh, farmers have for phosphorus, but there are other options out there that might be worth considering, especially in a bigger picture perspective and things like water quality. I wanna begin by giving some background for these different four R's to build a rationale for this study that we did. So as you can see in the top left, we have the, each of the four R's represented. So this is on the topic of the right source. Here, it's good to think about that phosphorus fertilizers are a very new technology. They're about the same age, a little bit younger than hybrids, for corn at least. And uh, this is a big deal because before uh, we were able to mine phosphate rock at scale, uh, around the time that we formed the state of Illinois in 1818 to the founding of the U of I, th th this whole time, pre-1900, was an era of not really having fertilizers, but having wastes like bone meal or manure. We're recycling phosphorus. It's not really a net input from the farm level. 
And then we get into what I think was phase one of phosphorus use in Illinois and really the world. It's a, a great microcosm of global developments in ag where we began to mine at scale phosphate rock. Um, and so this is a curve of global phosphate rock mining, but it's also true for Illinois. We see an uptick in the mining and the direct use of phosphate rock. So your great grandparents or great great parents may have been using phosphate rock directly. Then we get phase two, it was a little bit short lived. This is the super phosphates uh, era where we had single super SSP and triple super TSP phosphorus as the inputs. And those were displaced relatively quickly by the ammonium phosphates MAP and DAP. And I'll talk about that more in just a second. And so we really are into phase three. Perhaps we need a phase four where we hybridize among these different methods or sources. A bit more about phosphate rock. This was the key input for our states. And we were unique in that uh, for a period of time, we were having a lot of phosphate rock from Tennessee. Uh, those deposits have since been depleted. Now it's from Florida. Those will run out very soon. And then we'll have to switch to offshore phosphate rocks deposits. But the point is that uh, Illinois did have a pretty strong phosphate rock stage, unlike other states. Most of the Tennessee brown ores uh, were directed direct, uh, sorry, that were directed to Illinois by rail. Uh, there was a big demand in this state and the U of I pioneered a lot of the research on phosphate rock. In fact, as you can see here, the majority of studies ever published by 1918 on phosphate rock had been done in Illinois production systems. As we can see though from the graph in the top right though, by the 1970s, ammonium phosphates or even just super phosphates that are more soluble began to quickly outstrip phosphate rock. And phosphate rock now is rarely used, it's very bulky. Uh, it is permitted in organic certified systems. And so that's the major use of it today. Now, Illinois uh, soybean production is, it, I would think of as being contemporary with um, the use of pea fertilizers. Uh, so we first had soybeans introduced into the state in 1851. Um, this is uh, just north of St. Louis. Um, the plaque is on the left right there in Alton. And we also see that there was increasing interest in soybean initially from a hay fodder. Uh, it was a substitute for alfalfa or for clover, but as a grain crop by the 1930s. All right, and this is reflected in the Morrow plots, both the uptake of soybean being grown as we replaced oats with soybean because of mechanization, no need for oats for the draft power, um, we also began to use phosphorus input. So soybean and phosphorus fertilizers that were soluble arrived in the state, or let's say expanded in the state about the same time. A good example of this is the Mara plot shown here on campus. We can see uh, oats in the uh, lowest part, uh, soybeans in the second rotation and corn on, on the northernmost one. And uh, these changes were made relatively recently. Soybeans were the replacement for oats in 1966, probably late to the game compared to, to the rest of the state. And we also had to switch from phosphate, sorry, from superphosphates into diammonium phosphate in 66 as well. This is then what I mean by we saw roughly contemporary shifts from oats to soybean and from uh, phosphate rock, or yeah, from phosphate rock into super or ammonium phosphates in the 1940s and 60s. Now, all of our phosphorus is made from phosphate rock. And this is important to go over because we should think about MAP and DAP as simply brothers or sisters of superphosphates, but their parents are ultimately rock phosphate. Phosphate rock, rock phosphate, by the way, it's the same thing. There's a great publication on this by my predecessor going back 100 years, 110 years exactly, uh, in, a, in a, a bulletin that he published called Bread from Stones. I love the title, Bread from Stones, was in reference to the idea that using limestone and phosphate rock, both rocks ground up, one could recapitalize fertility of soils, like in the south of Illinois, where this professor worked and lived, um, to increase yields. And so at the time, the U of I, in, in the ensuing decades through 1940s, the U of I recommendations on phosphate rock were to, uh, were, were to add pretty high rates. We're talking 4,000 pounds per acre. Now this is of rock phosphate, it's about 8% P2O5, maybe 12% P2O5. Compare that with 46 to 52% for MAP or DAP. So um, it's still a high application rate, but it's low solubility form. 
And we can see this playing out in the Morrow plots shown here, where the fertilized plot has a pretty large positive balance, meaning a net accumulation of phosphorus in the soil over time. Here's the unfertilized but still cropped as a negative balance for mining fertility. And we can see that the large positive balance is largely built up uh, in the phosphate rock phase of the Morrow plots. And that phosphate rock is still there. Uh, providing a source of P for the crops in the Morrow plots likely. Now, phosphate rock was the original fertilizer. Now it's just really a feedstock. This is mined from large deposits. Most of this is found in Morocco, though as of exactly a week ago, the largest reserves that parallel, that compete with that of Morocco, were just found in Norway. So Norway may become uh, big on the scene for phosphate rock like Morocco has. Morocco had 95% of our global phosphate reserves until a week ago. So now they have roughly half of that, 47.5%. The point is that we mine phosphate rock shown here, and then we acidulate it. Simply, we add acid. Uh, if we add sulfuric acid, we get single superphosphorus. We can also make triple superphosphorus by combining phosphoric acid, and sometimes sulfuric acid. So these are the superphosphates. There's no nitrogen in the superphosphates. Uh, it used to be SSP was the choice. It has pretty high sulfur. Uh, triple super has less sulfur. That sulfur, by the way, is coming from the sulfuric acid used to produce these fertilizers. Again, there should be an arrow going to the triple super. And the other approach that was developed more recently was to use phosphoric acid with phosphate rock. And we make phosphoric acid by combining sulfuric acid with phosphoric to make MAP and DAP. So note that we're always using sulfuric acid to acidulate the feedstock. We just add a second acid of phosphoric to make MAP and DAP. This is also why there is very trace amounts of sulfur in MAP or DAP. We're talking 0.5% sulfur as opposed to 2 to 5% in some cases for triple super or single super. And that's 5% on the very high end. This effectively then is the family of the phosphates. We use largely these two today, ammonium polyphosphates and starter would be in the same family in liquid form, uh, but they're all highly soluble. There's a lot of uh, misconceptions, I think, on superphosphates like TSP, that it's inferior. Um, we sought to test this, but on the face of it, there's no reason to think that superphosphates are any less effective than the ammonium phosphates for supporting crop phosphorus uptake. In the US uh, and in Illinois, we see that uh, first DAP was on the scene and it was then, um, it began to out, uh, sorry, it, it began to outpace the, the, the use of rock phosphate um, and at the time then superphosphate. So shown in blue here is superphosphate, the DAP is in orange, we can see it rockets from barely being produced and sold in 1960 to within two decades by 1980, it's the dominant P source. MAP came later to the scene here in gray, um, and by the 90s, it was more commonly used, and roughly across the U.S., it's 50-50 of MAP and DAP. Still some triple superphosphorus. Um, that's the main form of superphosphates that we used in the U.S. In the Midwest, though, we're typically MAP and DAP, and more DAP than MAP, typically. Again, that's not statewide, that's Corn Belt-wise. So based on some recent reports from the Illinois Department of Agriculture and from the Midwest Department of Ags of different states, we estimate that roughly up to 90% of all pea sources in Illinois are coming from MAP or DAP or ammonium polyphosphates. So it's ammonium phosphates. Now, if we think about the composition of this, there is nitrogen present in MAP and DAP, but not in triple superphosphorus. And this might present an opportunity to decrease what I think of as a blind spot that to this point has not really been considered in nutrient loss uh, reduction efforts. So this means that our choice of phosphorus, the right source of phosphorus, might actually entail a chance to decrease nitrogen losses. This might seem counterintuitive, but we often forget that there is pretty appreciable amounts of nitrogen being co-applied with their phosphorus in the Midwest in the fall because we're applying it as MAP or DAP. There's ammonium there. I want to paint a picture of this for you. So if we consider the fact that across the 21 million acres of the state, we've got roughly half of that land uh, going into corn each year. And if we assume that there's fall application in front of the corn of the two-year crop rotation, we can do some very broad math on how much N is going on, co-apply with MAP and DAP. 
Now, because we're fall applying, there's a risk of losses of fall applied nitrogen. We're not applying this with an inhibitor, right? It's simply map or dap granules spread on the surface. These granules dissolve within days if it's wet. Um, and then if it's warm, we're talking about 50 Fahrenheit, the ammonium will nitrify into nitrate, and then it's susceptible to leaching losses, just like any other end source. So if we assume that half of the 11 million acres are going into the beginning of a corn phase, so half of our 21 million acres, roughly speaking, and we assume that half of the into corn acres, so a quarter of the total acres of the state, are getting 200 pounds per acre of DAP in the fall as a basic rule of thumb, that entails 198 million pounds of N that are being co-applied with phosphorus as MAP or DAP. In this example, it's DAP. All right, well, this extra N, sometimes it's thought to be free, it can be credited. This amount of N exceeds what we need to reduce our nitrate losses by, by 11%. So we have to reduce statewide nitrate N export by uh, 178 million pounds from non-point sources, meaning meaning the, the uh, ag sector, excuse me. Uh, this exceeds the, sorry, the amount that we're applying each fall um, exceeds that amount by 11%. So the, the, these are very large numbers, right? There is a significant amount of N being co-applied as MAP and DAP. Now, I'm not saying we need to switch fully to TSP or that we're losing all the fall applied N of MAP or DAP, not at all. Now, there's not much data out there on how much we are losing, but you might anticipate it is going to vary by when you apply the weather that winter, uh, then the method of placement. So it's a little bit difficult to predict. The point here is that uh, it is not a trivial amount of nitrogen being co-applied with MAP and DAP in the fall. The question then of how much is actually being lost to fall applied MAP or DAP, uh, be it in front of corn or in front of soybeans, we don't really know. Uh, we attempted a meta-analysis, meaning we tried to look at studies that have been published. We found exactly one study ever. So uh, we've got millions of pounds, hundreds of millions of pounds of that being co-applied in just this space. Imagine across the Corn Belt and in the world, and we don't really know what happens to the N. That I think is really intriguing. The one study ever done is shown here, uh, two sites in uh, Champaign in Illinois on the left and in uh, Waseca in Minnesota on the right. So two different sites in the Corn Belt. And what you're looking at is whether they applied a uh, map in the fall or in the spring over three years. And then they looked at the the amount of N recoverable in the soil in the top 12 inches as nitrate or as ammonia. So for example, when there was a fall applied map in the fall of 2004 in Urbana, in the, in the ensuing spring, May 25th, they sampled the top 12 inches and they found only about 30% of the map N remaining in the soil and largely all in the nitrate form. That's what the gray is. In contrast, in the spring, when they applied that same year, they found all of the nitrogen still there. Most of it, though, had already nitrified into nitrate in gray. And you can see in general across uh, all of these six site years that when you apply in the spring versus the fall, more of the N is retained and it, it has largely nitrified into nitrate. So this shows that we can convert the ammonium very quickly. And then if there's ample time before the crop is taking up the N, that we're going to be losing a fair amount of that N. So this can vary by year. So we've got as low as about a 50% loss this year for fall applied in, as high as an 80% loss in this year. So that's quite a range, but we're losing on average half of fall applied in based on this study. Again, it's the only study ever conducted that we know of that's been published, either peer reviewed or not peer reviewed. So now this is, um, again, the recovery of nitrogen in fall application. Um, this is not saying that we're losing it. I should be more careful with saying loss. This is what you what you find in the soil. It might be at 14 inches. It was missed by the auger by two inches. But typically, if it's missing in the spring beneath 12 inch depth, it's likely on its way down to the tile. All right. Now, this is matters for corn, especially because a lot of producers will credit the amount of N in MAP or DAP in the fall in the spring, especially. And I think this data suggests that by and large, for most years, uh, we can credit spring applied N for MAP and, MAP and DAP. Um, and for corn, that matters because obviously we need N for corn. For soybean though, there's no real benefit, at least economically, from applying supplemental N for soybean yields. I know that's changing as soybean yields push higher and higher bushel per acre yields, 
And on sandy soils like you have in some parts of Kankakee County or in Michigan, uh, they do apply UAN even or urea to supplement because there's not enough N in the soil to account for soybean N uptake. As a side note, the consensus today by researchers in the Corn Belt is that roughly half of all the soybean N in the biomass is from N fixation by the plant. The other half is from the soil. So we still want some soil ammonium N nitrate present, which we tend to find in our soils of Illinois if they're not sands. Now, the point here is that if we don't really need the supplemental N uh, from ammonium phosphate fertilizers, for soybeans, we have the, the wiggle room to think about P sources. We could actually go without the free nitrogen or the extra N from MAPRADAP, um, and we'd expect yields to probably be the same. And there might be benefits to water quality from that. Also, there is sulfur in triple superphosphorus. So there may actually be a yield benefit. Maybe that's the extra or the free nutrient of interest, not the nitrogen. Now, I want to say a bit more about the other uh, four R's that we tested before I get into the study details. So grain removal rates or how we do application rates. You, it's good to keep in mind that these are based on distributions that differ by crop and nutrients. So, and they're also based on the 70, 75th percentile to be safe. What does this mean? Well, it means that we're applying not the average P per bushel, we're applying the 75th percentile, average is 50th percentile. So to be safe, the state recommendations, how many pounds of P per bushel are based on the more conservative side in terms of not mining your soil. Now these are distributions. So if we're doing the maintenance application, which means that we're above the critical value of uh, 40 to 25 ppm, 40 to 50 pounds of P per acre on a Bray basis, then we're in the zone of the maintenance rate. These are distributions and here's why it matters. Circled here is shown for soybean. Um, so you can see that the amount of P205 in every bushel, this is pounds of P205 per bushel of the grain, that for soybean, like for any crop, there is a range. And so in some fields, we get lower removal rates, as low as 0.5 pounds of P205 per bushel soybean to as high as 0.9 pounds of P205 uh, per bushel soybean. Now, the average would be the 50th percentile shown here. The state recs currently are giving you the 75th percentile, not to be confused with 0.7 pounds right here, but the, the 75th percentile of this distribution. So this means that we're, for a lot of our fields, we're over applying on the maintenance rate. Uh, I think that's important to just point out there. I'm gonna pause here because I got a question from an attendee. Uh, in this study, was there any way to estimate how much of the unaccounted for N was lost to denitrification or taken up by growth on the field or a cover crop? I'm gonna answer this question now so that we don't forget about it and we keep the momentum present. So the question is in reference to this slide right here. Um, so in this study, they, they did not look at the fate of the nitrogen. They simply looked at how much N is recoverable in the top 12 inches. They did not look at leaching uh, beneath 12 inches or soil N beneath the 12 inch mark, nor did they look at the gaseous losses as you're asking. Um, so N2O or even N2 losses. And that might matter for water quality versus air quality interests. Yeah, great question. All right, so um, I'm gonna make a note that if there are questions either through chat or through voice, I'm happy to take them as we work through these slides together. So going back to the maintenance rate, I hope I, I've made clear to you that uh, these rates are not set in stone. They are ballparks on the conservative side. This matters because there's wiggle room in some years to cut back on the apparent maintenance rate because your field might actually be here. You've been applying here. So you can cut back by even a third of your maintenance rate, for example, and maybe be okay. We can also transiently mine soil fertility for a few years in, for example, high price input years. For timing and placement, uh, not too much to say about this. Uh, typically, uh, for placement, we have as the major application method, be it in front of corn or in front of soybeans broadcast. Uh, we see a lot more, at least in our neck of the woods in central state, uh, when there's pea in front of soybean is typically spring and banded in a strip system. Um, so then we look at oftentimes interactions of these. If we do fall versus spring broadcast compared to say spring banded, uh, what are the outcomes for yield? There's evidence that if we apply in the spring, that phosphorus use efficiency is higher 
allowing some folks to cut back on their build, on the build and maintain. They just add the maintenance rate, for example. Now, none of these four R's are really considered explicitly in the Illinois Agronomy Handbook. So we sought to, as a first step, address them in this project. So here's our design. We had two sites in central and south Illinois at Urbana and at Ewing and Champaign and Franklin counties, respectively. Soil types are Drummer and Flanagan for Urbana, Abba and Sisney at the Ewing RDC site in the south of Illinois. And we can see that we are in different kinds of watersheds that are priorities for nitrogen up north and then for phosphorus losses down south. And again, as I've mentioned, we anticipate end loss reduction benefits so less N is lost from considering the P source in front of soybean. Because soybean doesn't need the N of a map or DAP, we can use it as a lever to decrease nitrate losses. All right, so these sites were borderline P responsive, depending on who you talk to, it might merit an application to build a fertility, either on the border of needing a little bit of a build rate and on top of the maintenance rate. So our design into the four R's, we looked at two rates. Uh, these were based on 100% and three fourths, so 75% of the soybean removal rates based on the uh, agronomy handbook values. These looked like 60 and 45 of P205 uh, for Urbana and 45 and 34 pounds of P205 per acre for Ewing. So our low rate at Urbana is the same as the high rate at Ewing. These were built on historical more or less soybean yields at these two sites. Uh, we also included an experimental phosphorus source. This is a slow release map. Uh, magnesium map is what Struvite is. It's a 528 um, and it's applied at the same P rate as all the others. It's slow release. We included it to look at whether it might benefit yield by synchronizing with soybean P uptake in the later R stages when soybean really takes up a lot of its phosphorus. And of course, a P unfertilized control, so nothing added. And we applied these in the spring, um, either as banding or, or broadcast, or in the fall as broadcast only. So we have no fall broadcast, uh, sorry, no fall uh, banding, just a fall broadcast. So three treatments that are combinations of the timing and the placement. All right, so we looked at over two years at each site. So we have four site years total, yields, and then the losses of N and P, as well as yield scaled losses of N and P. I want to talk a little bit about how we estimate P leaching. This is important because we have estimates, not direct measurements. Uh, we use what are called resin lysimeters. Um, to be transparent with the audience, this is uh, the best possible approach short of using a tile. And if you don't have tile systems like in the south where you get fragipant and then you get horizontal subsurface losses, uh, this is the next best thing. So a resin lysimeter has these little beads. It looks like um, like fish row, fish eggs, or caviar, um, and you pack them into a PVC coupler. This is then buried between a sandwich layer of sand in the PVC coupler in the soil profile and an undercut. And that way we avoid the preferential flow pathways that we've opened by disturbing the soil to install this lysimeter. Instead, we capture the infiltration over an undisturbed part of the soil. So you can see as we begin to shove this one into the undercut, what it looks like before the insulation is made. This is in Urbana clearly because of the soil color. Now these are a pretty good um, in terms of cost effectiveness ways to gauge N and P leaching. These ions will bind irreversibly the nitrate and the phosphate that they experience going down through the profile. So let's begin with our first result, which is yield. And to sum, to sum it up, uh, within each site, there is no difference in yield by any of our treatment combinations. So we've got here a layering of the placement and timing in the gray bars. So you can see fall broadcast versus spring banding or spring broadcast. And we've got the rates, which are no P added at all uh, versus the maintenance rate or three fourths of the maintenance, of the maintenance rate is our low application. Few observations, uh, higher yields at Urbana than at Ewing, watch the axes. So on average, we're about 50 bushel soybean with phosphorus at Ewing. On average, roughly speaking, more like 65 at Urbana. These averages though are uh, underlain by pretty high variability. This is all from uh, yield combines, not from hand harvest. So they're fairly accurate to our knowledge. Uh, and, and they've all been adjusted for the same moisture content. Now note that at Urbana, there really is no difference in the average uh, yield with phosphorus compared to no phosphorus in blue in 2021. 
maybe a little bit average yield uh, higher with phosphorus compared to no phosphorus in Urbana in the following year. Um, and we also see slightly higher average yields that year. But um, this is not different statistically. So the probability that this apparent higher value is due to adding P is pretty low. So probability based, that's what stats is. Uh, we don't really have much faith in this. In Urbana, there's also no effect statistically of adding phosphorus, including in this first year where it looks like to most people, we saw a yield increase. So if you're being careful, it looks like adding P did uh, increase yields. It probably didn't pay what it costs to increase those yields by. And statistically, uh, this apparent increase in value of yield with phosphorus at Ewing in the first year isn't really due to phosphorus on a probability basis. So basically, um, the variability is so high on these plots that it's hard to say. Now, that's not a bad thing, right? We're not looking to increase yields. We're trying to see, can we cut back a little bit on the maintenance rate? And can we um, have benefits in how we play with, do we have options or flexibility in when and how we apply the P? And the good news is that agronomically, there doesn't really seem to be a big difference. That's good news insofar as you want options. Bad news if you think, or if you're hoping that at least at these regions of the state, banding might increase yields, say at a lower rate compared to um, the broadcast, or would you get the same yield at low versus the high? We don't really see that. Now, there are obvious nutrient benefits for doing spring application, um, and there's probably going to be benefits to banding over the longer term for nutrient use efficiency, but that's not testable in this study. Okay, so that's yields. Because yields are the same statistically, grain pea removals with soybean harvest across all four set years is also the same. Again, note that Ewing in the first year sure looks like it's higher, and numerically it is a lot higher as an average, but statistically it's not. Um, and so we're seeing about four pounds per acre of pea more on average being taken off when we add pea fertilizer at Ewing compared to none because we saw yields go up by a commensurate amount. So again, um, the question is whether that pays for itself, it doesn't for what we applied. So that's the agronomics. Let's talk a little bit about the environmental aspects where, again, our interest is if we switch sources, if there's no difference in yield sort and yields among the P sources, which we did not see, the yields were the same across MAPDAP or TSP and Struvite, um, might there be benefits for water quality? And so what we see here is, again, here are two sites in the top right for the watershed importance. We see that in Urbana, uh, when you're adding MAP or DAP, we see higher nitrate leaching losses. So we've got the 5P fertilizer treatments. And when we add P, there's going to be the maintenance and the three-fourths of maintenance rate by color. And here we've got nitrate and loads, pounds of P per acre. Now, these seem like crazy high numbers. These are due to outliers like this one right here, where we've seen that small hot spot of the plot a lot of nitrate leaching. So keep in mind, these are resin lysimeters. These are not tiles that are integrating over five or six acres of a, of a research plot. This is going to be within a square yard in that micro location. Um, again, best we got at the moment. So we see a lot of variability. The bigger point is that if you look at the unfertilized soil in Urbana, we see tremendous variability and potentially and potentially very high magnitudes. So we see up to 150 pounds of unleached in a square yard when we had no fertilizer during the winter at Urbana. And this speaks to the high stocks of organic matter that can mineralize. We also see very, very low amounts. Now, if we take the control as a baseline comparison, uh, what we find is that TSP and Struvite, for that matter, which is slow release map, um, have the same amount of end leaching as no fertilizer being put on. And we see higher than that. So these are higher than the dash red line for MAP and DAP. So this does confirm, albeit with very, very messy data and using an operational estimate of resin lysimeters, that yes, when we fall apply MAP or DAP, which is what is being shown here, we do see appreciable losses of nitrogen in the ensuing winter months compared to triple super or even struvite. All right. Now, um, this variability was high at Urbana, but at Ewing, where we've got much lower organic matter soils, we saw very low variability in the unfertilized control. So again, in blue, that doesn't get any P or nitrogen via the MAP or DAP. And it's much lower variability because there's less organic matter to mineralize nitrogen to be leached. 
Here, the variability comes with the map and DAP sources, as well as the TSP, which this doesn't make sense to us because, well, there's no nitrogen there. It might be an effect of the P on organic matter. These soils are tough to work with for leaching because they have fragipans. Because of that, when there's vertical movement of water carrying leach nitrate down, when it hits the fragipan, it'll then flow horizontally. And so these resin lysimeters might be capturing horizontal flow, which is why we see very, very high values and very variable values on nitrate and leaching. So in some sense, leaching horizontally in these fragipans of the southern third of the state requires a different approach that no one to my knowledge has really figured out yet. So that's the big caveat for the Ewing data. Now we see the overall lower values of nitrate and leaching with TSP and struvite compared to MAP and DAP, less so though at Ewing. All right, so this is consistent with the one study ever published that we saw in Minnesota and in Illinois, finding that you're losing on average half of your N of fall applied MAP or DAP and up to 80% of your fall applied MAP or DAP nitrogen. This is consistent with that finding. What about phosphorus? We know that there can be benefits um, to the solubility of the P sources. So we looked at struvite because it's an increasingly of interest specialty phosphorus fertilizer. And there's also magnesium in struvite that can increase soybean yields in some systems. So um, at Champagne, we found that P leaching overall was uh, higher with MAP or DAP, even compared to triple superphosphorus. This could be from all the calcium of the phosphorus in triple super, it's largely calcium phosphates, but in soluble forms. Even, even when the calcium is not bound like it is in say rock phosphate to the phosphorus, and TSP, that calcium can complex and slow down or retard the vertical loss of phosphorus or just movement of phosphorus. That might be what's explaining slightly lower mean values in these lines right here for, T for TSP relative to MAP or DAP phosphorus leaching. Note we have much lower values, this is in P205, of leaching of phosphorus uh, compared to nitrogen, which is in the tens and even hundreds of pounds in hot spots. We're talking now single digits of pounds of P2O5 per acre. Uh, note that though, if we cut back on the rates of MAP and DAP, we get pretty low P leaching comparable with the control or the low solubility struvite. So there does seem to be a benefit of not just saving money on inputs in high price years, but also on the P leaching, meaning that we keep more of the fertilizer there. So this is a non-linear change. We're only increasing the application rate by 25% to go from the green to the pink but we reduce the P leaching by quite a bit. So there can be non-linear in a good way benefits for the economics and the leaching losses of our fertilizer phosphorus by cutting back a little bit on maintenance rates. Okay, so at um, Ewing, which is in Franklin County, uh, we see that uh, pretty low P leaching overall compared to Urbana, both in absolute values, but also across the P fertilizers. Um, we think this is, again, the fragipans, there's maybe less ability for the phosphorus to move horizontally, unlike nitrate. So once we hit the fragipan, the P stays put. At least that's the interpretation here. Okay. Now, that's absolute losses of N and P. I personally like to look at data on leaching losses or runoff losses on what's called the yield scale loss basis. So yield scale losses is a relatively new concept, the last, oh, five or six years. And the premise is that we need to contextualize a nutrient loss load, you know, five or say 20 pounds of N per acre with the productivity that was encumbered by that. So if we're getting 200 bushel soy, uh, sorry, corn or 50 bushel soybean versus say 300 and 100 respectively, um, that is important to, get, to uh, contextualize what the losses are. So it's really how many pounds of N are we losing per bushel produced? or in the case of soybean, P leash per bushel of soybean. And that's a more competitive metric that accounts for land use efficiency. So if we looked at this, um, we find that there's no observations ever published. This is the first study to do so on yield scale losses for soybean. Uh, there's been work on corn and largely just for nitrogen. So what we find is that, excuse me, the cat's on the keyboard. Uh, what we find, geez, here we go. Excuse me. So what we find is that um, if we look at Urbana and Ewing on the figure here, we're showing struvite for simplicity and MAP for simplicity because MAP and DAP are the same results. Struvite and TSP are the same results. So this could easily be TSP right here. And on the left hand, the light gray would be DAP as well. 
And note that we see a lot lower leaching with struvite and TSP relative to MAP. So MAP is here in gray. Now, uh, because we had similar yields across all the systems, because we saw more P leaching with MAP or DAP, this is P leaching now, uh, we see higher yield scale P losses in Ewing, especially for MAP. This points out that if we maintain yields, but we decrease our P losses, that that's a win because we're producing the same amount of grain for less environmental impact. Now, this might matter because there's increasing interest by some uh, buyers, especially overseas in Europe, on not just climate footprints, CO2 per unit of grain produced, but also on the water quality footprints of their grain. And so this might be a uh, free market solution to nutrient loss reductions that are coming down the road. Maybe not, but these are whispers that a few of us have heard out there. Okay, so some takeaways. Uh, one is that yield and the, the removal of phosphorus with soybean harvest was similar across the P sources, the rates, the timing, and the placements. So basically, it was all similar. We were doing very careful tweaking. We're not being bold here and cutting the rates by 50% of application. Uh, this is overall good news in the sense that it doesn't really matter what piece source you use for yields. It doesn't really matter if you cut back in one or two seasons by 25% on the maintenance rates uh, and how you apply the P does not really seem to matter for soybeans. Again, for these four site years that we have, it gives you options as the takeaway. Now, because yields are the same, if there are certain combinations of these four R's that will manifest in lower and NP leaching, that's a win-win. We get agronomic profitability or let's say productivity being maintained while also improving water quality. And this is especially tr true for the sources. By using triple superphosphorus, we can totally avert the weather dependent, but on average 50% to 80% losses of the N of MAP and DAP if it's fall applied. There's also sulfur in the triple superphosphorus that might be beneficial down the road, especially in the south of Illinois, given uh, very iffy and inconsistent, but sometimes S responses that we see. All right. So if we think about the implications, um, I think there's a lot of implications that go beyond soybean phosphorus for ours. One is that, in general, um, we find that baseline leaching of nitrogen and even phosphorus is very high in some cases. It's higher in soils with higher organic matter in the flat and black of central north. It's also variable tremendously. So going by four feet over to the next plot, we can see a hundredfold difference in nitrate leaching. And this matters for research because it means that we need to be very careful with what we conclude on studies on leaching of nitrogen and phosphorus from given practices if we're using only a couple, for example, resin lysimeters. It speaks to a good a route to improve how we estimate these losses. And second is that even if we apply no nutrients, right, we are going to be losing nutrients because of high organic matter content that's going to mineralize. This opens the door or points to the need rather for things like cover crops. Even with no fall applied NRP, they can still have benefits to retain uh, our native soil fertility present. Third insight is that there are confirmed benefits. We are the second study ever to be published that shows that you are losing the majority, if not all of your MAP or DAP nitrogen in very wet and warm winters, and at least half of it in most winters. And so if you simply switch sources to TSP, simply, I know it's more than just that, uh, there's tremendous benefits. Uh, if we think about the example at the beginning of this, if we are co-applying almost 200 million pounds of N, as DAP and MAP in the fall in our state every year. If we are losing half of that, that's 100 million pounds to the 176 million pound reduction that we need. So swapping out to TSP or say using slow release phosphorus like shrewd or using cover crops can all help move the needle on that. And uh, fourth is that because soybeans can take a lot of practices like no tillage and covered crops better than maize can, it's a little bit, you know, corn is a bit more finicky. Um, there's potential for soybeans to act as a lever. It can be the crop that can get the BMPs of cover crops and, and no tillage to really move and draw down on nitrate loss reductions. And I think that's the promise of soybean. All right. So, um, this then, I'll end on that, is that there's still a lot of room here, and, and our study points to because of high background losses, meaning no N, no P applied, we still see leaching of those, 
a lot of room for things that try to immobilize nitrogen, like no tillage, as well as things that scavenge nitrate, like cover crops. So this is the case, um, I think, for soybean as well. Here's an example from Piatt County. This is from Eric Miller's field, a city we're doing with Schaefer, Dan Schaefer, excuse me, in uh, Lowell Gentry. This is the last two years of tile nitrate uh, loads. And what we see is that, yes, in most years, we do get more nitrate and from tiles and for soybean, but that's still, that is still an appreciable magnitude. And if we've got cover crops in the brown gap bridging the corn to soybean, we can really help draw down on a lot of this nitrate. So soybeans can take the cover crop in front of them pretty well. Now, in some years, as Lowell has found, this is his data shown here, uh, we actually see more net losses in soybean through tiles than from corn. So after soybeans, sometimes we see more N losses. This might seem counterintuitive until you realize that we're losing a lot of our nitrate from organic matter mineralizing. This is not to say that that's inevitable and just the background that we can't control. It simply suggests that practices that are great for soil health and conservation uh, and preserve money by preserving soil can also double dip for water quality benefits. And this then is the topic of our future work. So along with, with um, sorry, we have a new ISA project uh, for the next five years that began this past fall, where we're trying to integrate soil health, uh, water quality, and carbon credits, including carbon stocks, at, uh, sorry, carbon stocks increasing, meaning sequestration, as well as greenhouse gas emission mitigation alongside the agronomic productivity. We, and this is being done now at three sites, expanding from our two sites that you just heard about to the Northwest. The idea then is to understand how all of these things work in conjunction. This will enable uh, trade-offs to be optimized depending on producer interests. If the interest is in maximizing soybean yields and soil health, well, we have data to understand how across different soil regions, how these might be optimized. If the interest is to look at water quality and soil health, then we also have data on that as well. So this is a big flagship product we have to benchmark these outcomes. And we've got two field days that may interest the audience. These are in-person days coming up at U of I uh, research and demonstration centers. First is July 26th at Monmouth, and then the next day, if you want to go all the way down south, back to back, uh, we've got the field day at Ewing, where we'll talk about this new project that's up and coming. So with that, I'd like to thank ISA for the support of the work you just heard about, as well as this new benchmarking project. And I'd be happy to take any questions here. We've got a few minutes, as well as by email. Thank you.